Okay, today we are going to be looking at this very interesting topic, the mystery of godliness. Study and that it would urge you to do even further study in this area. This is more or less an introduction, an opportunity, and there is so much more that we can glean as we study. The mystery of, of godliness. You know, when we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, we read from the King James Version and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. One, he was justified in the spirit. Two, number three, he was seen by angels. Number four, he was preached unto the Gentiles. He was believed on in the world, in the cosmos. He was received up into glory. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. Yes, he was manifested in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. That dove came down and and, and 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 said and that spoke to the fact that the Godhead approved him. He was seen by angels, I think of the resurrection, preached unto the Gentiles, called the apostle, preached to the Gentiles. He was an apostle called to the Gentiles. And since then so many of us we have heard the preaching of God's word and we have been changed. Believed on in the cosmos, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him will not perish, but have eternal life. And he was received up into glory. He certainly received up and he's coming again. Beyond all questions, the mystery of godliness is great. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. You know, we've been looking at fruitfulness guaranteed. And the scripture, this scripture becomes very relevant. The one that we talked about, about the mystery of godliness as we circle back to our study on fruitfulness with special reference to our launching pad scripture, 2 Peter chapter 1, we are reminded that our journey includes adding godliness. Let us read from verse 4 to 8, 2 Peter chapter 1. Wherefore are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, faith that you have, believing those promises, you add virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience. We've been studying patience. We spent a long time on that. And now we are at to patience, godliness. But the journey is not done. To godliness, we still have to add brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, agape, love, charity, love, the selfless love, laying down your life, God's kind of love. It says, for if these things be in you and abound, they're plenty. 
They make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll have the ability to bring forth and you will bring forth. And our trust is that we will bring forth at the hundredfold realm. We're reminded of the high priest's garments, the Levitical high priest's garments, which are a type for us. We are priests and kings, and priests and kings are of the order of Melchizedek. And the Melchizedek priesthood is superior to the Levitical, Aaronic priesthood. We have a study on that. And so our fruitfulness is guaranteed. And so here we go. I believe the promises. Faith. I add to faith virtue. I add to virtue knowledge. I add to knowledge temperance. God control. I'm pressing towards the mark. I'm moving away from corruption into incorruption. I add no patience. But then here are we adding what we call godliness. What is this godliness? What are we talking about? But that's not the end. We're running like those who do not beat the wind. Brotherly kindness still to be added and charity. We're going to have an entrance, glorious, abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. We will not be barren or unfruitful in that intimate knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember the Lord's Prayer? In John 17, life eternal is to know God and to know the Son of God whom he sent. Now, this word godliness that's translated 15 times in 15 verses in the New Testament, 14 times as godliness, and one time, holiness, the meaning, reverence. the meaning is reverence, respect, piety towards God. Holiness, even though you know the word holiness has got another meaning. I don't want us to mix up godliness with holiness. But there is one time in which the scripture does translate this word that translates, you know, the Greek G2150. Once it's translated holiness. I want you to hear what this word sounds like. Strong's G2150. Say by Let's hear it again. Strong's G twenty one fifty. Say by up. Yes, that's the word. It's translated fourteen times in the New Testament as godliness. And that's the same word in Second Peter chapter one, adding godliness to patience. Now, going back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, 16, it says, and without controversy, that mystery of godliness is great. And without controversy, what does that mean? How can it be translated? It's saying without question, beyond all question, great indeed we confess, and most certainly by common confession. We all agree without argument, just the name of, just to give you a few translations. So this thing about godliness is tremendous. 
Then it says, great is the mystery. Godliness is a great mystery. It's a great secret, a hidden truth. Our religion contains amazing revelation. And you remember, the word of God says, the fear of the Lord, which is to depart from evil, and God gives his secrets to those who fear him. So I believe a revelation of godliness will come to our own hearts. And in our own lives, we will manifest godliness. So this mystery of godliness that we read about starts with God. However, our focus in this study is how a revelation of God in his godliness and his godliness can now be translated to us in our responses, our behavior, our living, and our life. I do believe that we have all, to a greater or lesser extent, examined and have received some measure of revelation on each of those six aspects. Those six aspects that are on the screen of this mystery of godliness. God in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by an angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the cosmos, and received up in glory. I believe we have all had some measure of revelation on each of these aspects. There's, of course, always room for further and deeper insight, which I will urge you to desire and to explore. But I will now continue with our responses. Our adding of godliness. We must know in specific areas of our lives what we should be adding. God's got a manifestation of his mystery, which I believe we can have deeper and deeper understanding. But we need to add. I want us to look at Timothy, the book of Timothy. It seems as though Timothy, that apostle, had quite a lot of insight into the area of godliness. And I will take a few verses and we will look at it. Going to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. He says, but refuse profane and old wives' fables. He's telling us what to, to keep away from, what to reject. The old people say this, they say that. You have examples of all kinds of old wives' fables, superstitions. If you, after six o'clock, you must go into the house by your back. And I'm certain that you can name so many fables that you hear the old people say. You hear the old people say, bread, you mustn't throw it away unless you wet it with water. Oh, there are so many of them. The Bible says, refuse them. Refuse them. So in order for me to exercise myself unto godliness, I need to be able to refuse old wives' fables, profane and old wives' Hey, fables, this is what the old people say. Go on to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Oh, I have nothing against exercising. It says, but bodily exercise profits little. Of course, in comparison to exercising myself in the area of godliness, it says, godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is, as I'm living now, and my life for all eternity, which of course starts now. Once I've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. So I need to be able to be temperate with respect to bodily exercise. Do you know there are people who spend more hours per day 
exercising physically than they do in terms of exercising in the area of godliness. So here, Timothy is giving us some counsel. Here he's giving us some counsel. And we need to take heed. We need to pay attention. Then in 1 Timothy chapter 6 from verse 3 to 5, we have some counsel here. If any man teach otherwise, otherwise do what? We need to ask. And consent not to hold some words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go back to the Gospels. Check out those words that are written in red in some Bibles. And to the doctrine which is according to godliness, the apostles' doctrine. You remember in the Acts of the Apostles that they continued in the apostles' doctrine? We need to be lining up with what the Lord Jesus Christ taught and what the apostles taught that are verified. That's truth. The word of God says, if a man teach otherwise, so he's, if somebody was teaching that, or he was listening to somebody and consenting to what is not wholesome, the word of God says he is proud. He knows nothing. But doting about questions and strife some words, they have some people who just love to argue, causing envy, strife, reelings, evil surmisings, perverse disputing some men of corrupt minds. The word of God says their minds are corrupt. They might be intellectuals. They might have gone to university. They might have PhDs and all kinds of degrees. But the word of God says their minds are corrupt and destitute of the truth. They suppose that gain is godliness. We don't need to suppose that they, that kind of gain is godliness. The word of God actually says, withdraw yourself. Pull away. So as I follow and after godliness, as I add godliness, there are going to be certain kinds of discussions conversations that I need to withdraw myself from. I'm learning the practicals of adding godliness. I need to refuse certain things in my mind, profane and old wise fables. I need to be temperate in terms of bodily exercise as compared to the spiritual exercise. And I need to be careful with those who want to argue philosophy, psychology, sociology, and all the ologies that do not line up with the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles' doctrine. Let's move on. Continuing, Timothy tells us, godliness with contentment is great gain. He tells us we didn't bring anything into this cosmos, into this world. We didn't bring anything. We, caught, we came in naked, squalling and bawling as a baby. It's certain that you will carry nothing out. You will carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. There is a contentment that comes when there is godliness. There is a contentment that is associated with godliness. It's not that God's got anything against us having money. But listen what he says. But they that will be rich. And I think that is no matter what. By hook or by crook I got to be rich. Fall into temptation and a snare. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Notice the lusts are foolish. And they're hurtful, drowning us, drowning men in destruction and perdition, making it, making, you don't want to be lost, do you? You want to be found. You don't want to be drowned in destruction, perdition, 
it says, for the love of money, didn't say money, is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. Some people do all kinds of things to make money. They make decisions based on making the next dollar. They may neglect family. They may neglect a particular relationship that they need to have. They may neglect uh, certain aspects of their discipleship just to make money. Some people change one country to another on the basis of getting some more money. The word of God says, the love of money is the root of evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Some people don't tell you this story, you know. It says, but thou, O man of God, O woman of God, flee these things. We've been told so far by Timothy to refuse certain things, to withdraw ourselves from certain things. Now we're told to flee these things. We need to flee all that you see that has been highlighted here. Flee these things. Flee the love of money. Flee. Making decisions based on getting the next dollar. Follow after righteousness. Now righteousness, holiness, and godliness, they are connected, but they are differences. And we are focusing on godliness. It says follow after godliness. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Follow after these things. There are things to flee and there are things to follow. In order for us to add godliness, there are some things to flee and there are some things to follow. Let's pay attention. Let's pay attention. Let's pay attention. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5 talks about having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Refuse, withdraw, flee. No, it's telling us to turn away from such turn away. When there is just a form of godliness, nice looking religion, but the actual power of God to transform a life is not there. You're seeing no evidence of fruit. You're seeing no evidence of God's power. Oh, I long for so much more of his dunami. I want to see both in the character and the charisma. The character, the fruit of the spirit, and the charisma, the gifts and the manifestations of healings and deliverance and raising the dead and, and the whole area of metamorphosis. The transformation, that being transformed from one level of glory to another. We do not want to deny his power. We want to see his power. Your kingdom come, O oh God. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thine is the glory, the power. Thine is the power, the glory. We want to see the dunamis of God. The word of God speaks about having a form of godliness. We don't want that. So we need to turn away from the form of godliness to the genuine godliness. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's a servant, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which is after godliness. Beloved, truth, acknowledgement of truth is key to adding godliness. And the acknowledging of the truth, the acknowledging, saying, yes, this is truth. Truth about God as he reveals it, Truth about myself, 
as he reveals it to me, truth about his purpose, truth about the enemy, truth about everything that I need to know truth about. The acknowledging of the truth is key if you're going to add godliness. Hear me. There are things we need to turn away from, to run from, withdraw ourselves from, flee from. But then we need to draw near, acknowledge truth. Sometimes it's so difficult to acknowledge truth. Especially when some things aren't so nice. We prefer to sweep it under the carpet. But the word of God says, the acknowledging of the truth is after godliness. And I think my final scripture in this short video, 2 Peter chapter 3, going verse 11 and then 14, it says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy manner of life? Conversation, there is more than what you're saying, but your manner of life, it's an old English word, meaning manner of life and godliness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. That's where godliness is leading us to. When we add godliness and we continue to add, and that godliness abounds, it's so that we may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. I encourage us to meditate on this little short, this little study, and may it be a blessing to you. And may you yourselves have great understanding that can be shared with others to build us up in this area of godliness. God bless you. God richly bless you. Amen.